So, and um, it's actually the autopersonal of architecture is the evolution of the discipline, and architecture is actually strongly connected up with all the different design disciplines. That's the first thing I want to mention. So it's the auto praise, it's the self-making, the discursive evolution of the design disciplines, which has undergone a series of transformation during my lifetime already. One of them was the kind of massive investment and switch to computational design, thinking tools and ways now of manufacturing. What I've started to talk about as parametricism, that still goes on. But the design discipline, and that's happened actually, I mean, it's happened with the Bauhaus already and with a firm like Zadig Architects, it's really all the design disciplines from urbanism all the way to architecture and theory design, but also product design, fashion design, graphic design, web design, in fact, as well. Um, and so web design has been the preserve of uh, graphic designers largely. I think architects will move into this, but we're already all one family, one group of designers where we can switch between our disciplines. I won't read you the abstract, which is basically talking about um, this transformation, the expansion of uh, architecture into cyberspace, and that what becomes very important here is semiology, is the meaning dimension, the symbolic dimension, let's say, of form, of spaces, their meaning, rather than just also their physical uh, constitution, which is more kind of an engineering business. So I wanted to offer these three theses on the advent of cyberspace. Thesis one, in the coming age of VR empowered cyberspace, architects will take over the design of all internet interaction interfaces uh, as we move from that graphic to the spatial paradigm. Cephas 2. This expansion of architecture's remit will further distill the discipline's core competency, namely the spatial visual ordering of information and communicative interaction. So my thesis has been for many years now that the core competency of architecture is about the ordering of communicative interaction through framing, through um, a spatial visual language, in fact, built and broadcast <laughs> in brick and mortar and 3D space, but the essence of this is really that articulation of information and setting up of communication frames. And that becomes now um, clearer and quite distilled when cyberspace comes in because there the uh, physical engineering aspects are kind of absent or they exist in a different way under the hood of the uh, computational system. So thesis three, AR-empowered cyberspace will fuse with urban space, implying a radical transformation of built, in, built architecture and urban life. So that's thesis three. And I will talk at the end how we have, will actually experience that layering or integration of cyberspace and the urban spaces. I want to um, just step back what this means and the large arc of history a further acceleration in productivity because we're going to have an exp further expansion of the division of labor. So we just want to show you this diagram. Um, for literally thousands and thousands of years, living standards have been more or less the same. They have not been, there was no progress. There was technological progress, but it was always absorbed through larger in populations, no increase of living standards. And only at the Industrial Revolution came in and capitalism came in, but we actually had markets and an expansive social cooperation. Globalization started as well. You have this fantastic takeoff of living standards, of material freedom. And I think that's very important to understand why this happened, how this happened. And the question, is this continuing <coughs> to skyrocket? And I think it could and might and will. So the basis for that, we know since Adam Smith, actually at the same time as this takeoff occurred, we already uh, economic theory understanding that takeoff. Prosperity depends upon social cooperation by the division of labor. Very simple, Adam Smith's notion, but the next thing is very important. The division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. That means the larger the market, the larger the division of labor, and the larger the prosperity potentials. So this kind of global cooperation is what we can look at. 
in reverse, of course, as well, is that, yes, uh, the extent of the market is limited by the division of labor. So these are mutually enhancing effects. And um, again, this division of labor, the advantages of social cooperation through division of labor and exchange, that is actually the raison d'etre of all societies. So Mises, another great uh, economist, talks about the law of association or the law of society formation, namely social cooperation delivers prosperity. And now we're looking at an internet empowered expansion of the vision of labor in the global knowledge economy, which is truly global. And as we know, we can tap into and have accessible to each other. That's the notion, everybody's real time updates and innovations and contribution to the knowledge economy in theory. Of course, only to the extent that we can be made aware that we can find and access and navigate towards these information and potential collaborators and corporations. So cooperation is potentially global involving everybody. And therefore the internet, of course, is incredibly important. And uh, it's been that um, graphically controlled and, and developed um, medium by our colleagues, the graphic designer. And of course, it's great. And uh, so the internet evolves from the domain of graphic designers based on the analogy of the magazine towards becoming the domain of architectural designers based on the analogy of the building and the city. So that's the thesis. And then we started, we start seeing that. We start <coughs> experiencing that transition. Actually, initially it was just textual, then it became graphic with graphic user interfaces and the text and image, but it's very much based on the analogy of the magazine, graphic designer's domain, and now it shifts into the architect's domain. And something which at the beginning of the internet was already envisaged. Because the notion of cyberspace came up right at the time when the internet emerged. Actually, myself, it's nearly 30 years ago now, we, uh, when the internet started, we did, I was at TU Berlin, and we did already a project of cyberspace, the virtual college, imagining a 3D immersive navigation space where the events, the informations are distributed in a spatial experience, VR style. So, so that's been talked about, imagined a long time ago, but it's only happening now through multi-user uh, games, through game engines, but through certain metaverses and VR worlds, which are now becoming increasingly pertinent. And of course, the last year, or the, the, these kind of 10 months or so, nearly now of a COVID, <laughs> lockdown experience has accelerated this enormously and that brings that to the foreground a lot of money is flowing into the space uh, shifting from real estate to virtual space from uh, real cities to metaverses and there's already uh, in these metaverses and i'll show you the later decentraland and insomnium space that you actually have to purchase locations within that so here again we're moving in precisely from uh, these interaction spaces information spaces which are graphic design based, magazine based, like Zoom, into uh, these like Confero Martins, one of many firms who are trying to push this idea of virtual events where you step into a world full of avatars, where you, where you also have media, you can watch exhibitions, but you can also have chats on the site and see many things simultaneously happening and roaming around and browsing around and not only relying on scheduled events. It's a kind of 3D browsing experience, which is at the same time a chat, chatting and <laughs> lecturing and conferencing space. So I think that is what I'm gonna focus on uh, as taken for granted, this is happening. And we architects are in fact the ones who will deliver um, this whole new world. And the thesis too was the expansion of architecture agreement will further distill the discipline's core competency, namely the spatial visual ordering of information and communicative interaction. So, and I will talk about a bit, I've been always saying that is the core competency, uh, even when it comes to the physical world environment. What we are in charge of is not the physical constitution, um, the, uh, you know, the structure, uh, the, 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 um, the construction, but more the way it is an ex structures an experience and the way it is uh, using a language to orient 
and, and, and configure social interaction situations in real space. So that's what I call a semiological project. And that's about providing order, not shelter. That's social functionality, not technical functionality. But what is most important here, this order, this ordering of social process in the physical built environment is delivered by a communicated demarcations. Not necessarily and increasingly not so much with, you know, serious physical barriers, fences, walls, um, um, but, but, and less physically enforced, but more it's a question of having the information of understanding and knowing and understanding a complex world and moving around it. I mean, it's the tendency which we're seeing. And that's why I focused on this idea of architecture as framing of communicative action and interaction. But the important thing is the framing of interactions via design setting includes now also, of course, the framing of online interaction. These are our colleagues, and it's the same task of structuring a social situation, a communicative situation, a collaborative situation, and, and, and to, to set that up. Uh, uh, whether it's in a 2D space, the graphic designers, and now our 3D navigable space, where the analogy with the building and city becomes prevalent. So we are perfectly placed to do this, but particularly those of us who have actually always thought about architecture as in terms of the, uh, let's say, semantically charged um, environments which, which we navigate on the basis of semiology basically so the designer's task of framing interaction events pertains therefore to web and virtual events as much as to those events hosted in, in in buildings and in a way looking at that design you have of course user interface design very prominently or in and then the expansive notion of user experience design ui ux and in a way we can say all design is user experience design or user interface design i mean user experience design to the extent of a framing interfacing where the actual content actually comes from life itself or from uh, the client's uh, social processes but the framing so these phrases um, and self-understanding of what so far has been the web designer self-understanding can actually be generalized and fits perfectly across all design disciplines. And that includes product and fashion and so on. So, and the three key sub disciplines of design, and that goes across all disciplines, starting from urban design all the way to web design, and now let's say cyberspace design, is phenomenology, which is about the um, perceptual tractability and comprehensibility, cognitively, perceptually, of what we are engaging with and entering into. So we need to reflect on the limits of perception, on you know, visibility, intervisibility, but also comprehensibility, legibility in terms of perception. Semiology, we need to understand that there is a kind of semiological encoding where you know material, colors, light levels, position in space, front, back, middle, mean something. They have social relevance. They are semantically encoded. So that's a semiological project where also the not only position, but also the morphology, the forms, as well as textures, moods, etc., cetera, um, mean something particular in terms of decoding and encoding, rather, uh, particular social situations. And there are many, many different kinds of social that to be distinguished. But now I'm adding something this to, I've always been talking about this, and a lot of people who know my talks have heard enough of that. There's a new element I want to bring in, which is geometry which connects to the fact which is in web design is the interaction design where it is what happens when I scroll or click or double click. So the different things I can do, scroll over and swipe and wipe. And then what happens? The way these things diminish, uh, appear, disappear, that's interaction design. And we have that in architecture, not so much so far. There's a little bit of that you could say, is it a is it a swing door, a sliding door, a window, or blind? How do I interacting with the built environment? Dramaturgy, but now, and I'll show you later, if we develop more and more interactive environments, robotically and AI empowered, let's say, responsive environments and spontaneous creative environments, with a lot of these elements like partitions, uh, lighting systems, 
uh, interactive and responsive dramaturgy, let's say the kinetic dimension of the built environment is something we also need to reflect. And again, you can see that these three categories are absolutely parallel. They universally apply uh, the same to a, to a fashion outfit. Dramaturgy is how do you can how how do you open the zipper? How do you kind of stretch and move, put on and off some of those guns? Um, so step back. William Gibson, New Romancer, a kind of late 80s novel envisaging something like the Matrix, something like cyberspace. We were living in a in a in a virtual world. And then in the a, a also anticipating the web, or when you know at the very infancy of the web, already the, the theorizing of cyberspace, the architect actually Michael Benedict. And it's very interesting, he is describing it, of course, as a semiological project to some extent. And that's what also set me off in terms of developing the virtual college and thinking of architecture generally, not only cyberspace, which I had to wait for another 25 years, uh, in terms of semiology. So, um, so in unlike in architecture, physical architecture, where the centrality of communication is somehow obscured for most people, in cyberspace, the focus on communication and information and navigation, information spaces, etc., is the central purpose, and that is immediately obvious. So, so the semiological project in cyberspace, you simply can't avoid it, and it's and, and you can't get distracted by you know gravity and physics and construction and uh, you know geometric fit and 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 so on and so forth. So, so that that will help. So I think what I've been talking about without much resonance for the last 20 years, if cyberspace is coming, there will be a lot of resonance for those who are engaging in, in web design in terms of semiology. So the purpose of spatial level information, uh, that general purpose of all design is what leads right away to architecture scholars, a piece of semiology and semiology. And now I also would say with respect to web and uh, cyberspace, for sure, dramaturgy, but also I think in architecture, dramaturgy will become um, more important as we move forward. Oh, yeah. So I've been talking about the semiological project. You see what we're meaning here is that you don't necessarily structure and order social process by physical barriers and walls. You can do that too. Uh, but you do that by demarcations, by thresholds, and you can have multiple inscribed, let's say, um, meaningful lines, zoning and subzoning, uh, which then orders a social process like a sports game, a team game. And there you can see we always have to bring in the actors. We have to think about not looking at a space and basically say to ourselves how beautiful it is, how crisp it is. We have to actually imagine that social interactions, which is the, the purpose um, of these environmental design features, the thresholds, the, the, the zoning and subzoning. And therefore, what we're looking at here in a social situation, which is structured by the various props, uh, thresholds, levels, as well as costumes. There's costume design as well here, you know, team A, team B, referee, goalkeeper. These are all different social roles with different uh, protocols of interaction in the various spaces. And that's a good metaphor, my analogy for the semiological project. And, you know, I wanted to show that there's an enormous amount of creative designerly freedom in order to develop a semiological system. So it's the core information is in the system of differences, that you distinguish the different places when it's on a chessboard, and that you distinguish the different um, pieces or play pieces, and then attached to them is the various moves each can make. And all you have to do is distinguish them properly so they can be confused, and off you go and have your play. So there's many different ways of doing this. And if you now go from there and into something like the virtual world, the cyberspace, where actually all you do is about symbolic distribution of places, rules, access, uh, uh, situations, um, and you distinguish different zones so that become, you, you know, that users can actually navigate this, orient, find themselves, find the destinations, find the communication partners. So you basically is like a chessboard, and you have a lot of 
freedom to develop this and you should reflect on perceptibility criteria and you have a you need to have a systematic you should have a systematic semiological um, um, language at play so that for instance where you use uh, certain colors like blue hopefully that indicates similar things uh, rather than having a random distribution of color you would have a kind of semiologically structured use of color use of form use of position as well that means you have an ordered environment and an ordered environment is much more efficient whereas a kind of disordered environment is is chaos is garbage spill is is dysfunctional when it comes to the purposes so um and the same applies when you develop your avatar you can see here that again you will want to express yourself how do you want to be seen known who do you want to be similar to like fashion it's the same so we actually fashion designers will all become uh, avatar designers or so creating outfits of avatars and you want to have one as you have a whole wardrobe uh, um, uh, for your for their physical appearances and now we haven't appeared in the world you mean nearly for a whole year and we are starting to be have more kind of digital appearances so this will take over this will become more important the more we're going to be telecommunicating so we have these interesting metaverses, these kind of zones where they are no longer pure play zones. I mean, we of course we have the you know Fortnite and we have social hangout spaces in the shooting games and the gaming AI for multi-user games is delivered in technology. So the technology transfer from there into spaces <coughs> which are more really a second life, a second world. Uh, which I think should eventually connect up and do communication with matter also for your real life, for the productivity gains, working environments, selling environments, same environments of exchange, as well as information exchange and collaboration potentially. So that's what I see. If you're going from pure play into kind of semi-play into seriously hardworking um, environments, and remember the beginning of the talk, prosperity gains, division of labor, cooperation, and the, these spaces could make an enormous contribution for our material well-being in the world. And uh, so we, we, do, we, we do have this happening. We have a lot of events. <laughs> they have their virtual and digital substitutes in Decentraland, for instance. We have, obviously, fashion shows and launches of so-called buildings, of course, the virtual buildings. Uh, in casinos for gambling, exhibitions, gallery events, etc. So every and, and every client and institution I know, in terms of museums and cultural institutions and universities and corporate entities, they all have, they are developing now, you know, virtual events, virtual offerings, and uh, that is a big thing. And of course, Facebook is onto that uh, with the whole um, Oculus kind of world of. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, VR and AR. So the way you have these <laughs> avatars of yourself, you can, uh, and then you can place yourself and layer yourself into Facebook headquarters, for instance. And the idea of layering that, so we will be co-present, some of us still going to work for meetings, etc. And then some of us will be com not commuting, will be kind of joining virtually. So this kind of layered double world is the world which we have to conceive of and develop. And that means all of our projects will have kind of digital twins, perhaps. Or anyway, we can have a seamless expansion then from this space into a truly virtual space. But they should connect up with the same spatial visual language, with the same corporate identity, institutional identity. And again, Facebook is having these kind of crazy toy worlds. I think this is called Horizon. Let's just play, but play is always has been somehow in this obliquely related to reality. So if you play here, you're learning new social skills, you're learning to engage uh, and, and play multiple personas with your avatars and make contact in virtual world. So this play in the end uh, is a distraction perhaps, to some extent, it, but it's also muscle flexing preparation for the real VR worlds, and you can have also, you know, satisfying clubbing events. Uh, I don't know how satisfying they are, but recently, actually, we celebrated Theo Sporopoulos' birthday in Mozilla kind of VR world, and um, I don't know where we're going to do our Christmas party from Zadid Architects. As we're still all locked up, these technologies will 
will really um, um, take off. I think this is the way to, to celebrate an office party. Uh, and this is from uh, Somnium Space. But also serious uh, events like um, trade fairs, an exhibition with attached conferencing are now hosted VR uh, or, or virtual. I mean, and in the sense that you, you, you might also have a graphic user interface navigating uh, these um, uh, virtual 3D worlds. You don't necessarily go with the headset. So we have this, uh, you, you can, there's a series of locations, you can place your stand, you can show your wares, you can place your 3D model, your products, your logos, and off we go with uh, these kind of companies um, hosting virtual exhibition events. And I think they, this is work for us. We will do these things, we will create these places, uh, and who else? And we will do a better job. Inside Architects is very much well prepared for that. Um, and we could probably do better than the, the current web designers who are all coming out of the graphic uh, design world. And then you can layer in, um, um, of course, video feeds and other media would, would, be, would be placed and overlaid. So I think that's uh, happening. And there's already firms out there where you can, uh, you know, for $20,000, uh, you have a, a corporate can have a weekend conference or a two, three day conference at Confirmatic um, um, with, you know, I, I don't know, maybe up to 300 um, participants. So, and uh, now what I've been developing is for the real world is, of course, super pertinent for the virtual world as well, which is a semi-logical project. I'm just showing you a project that's developed with AIDRL with, some, with, with, with my team there. So you can see here that uh, you see various pieces of furniture, you have an overall uh, space, you see different um, entities, there's also kinetics involved, and it's a complete total design. But the morphologies are not just come up with because we like this, we like that or because they fit with each other physically, but no, there isn't, there's a language a vocabulary and the grammar uh, behind that. And I'll just briefly explain that these grammars and uh, vocabularies are based on system of distinctions. So the first big distinction is the bound spaces, which are the business spaces, and the unbound spaces, which are leisure, circulation, more, more public zones. So there's all the spaces which have no boundaries. And you can perceive that whether you're in a kind of unbound or bound space. And that tells you something. I mean, this is some of this is quite intuitive, and we would already expect that. But make it explicit. So we go to business spaces, which are always bound spaces. We have two. We have the concave versus the convex, and this is all the meeting zones, and this is all the work zones and teamwork. So, so that's a clear distinction. And each of these, of course, they have an infinite number variety of these closed convex spaces or <laughs> amoeba-like spaces. And then parametric can also in between. If there is a condition, you might say, where there's something, a meeting, on the other hand, it's kind of a heads down working zone. With, um, uh, maybe there might be in between zones where you switch between meeting and working and work together, a workshop space. So you have this in betweening. So that's a little bit a simple setup of a vocabulary. And then the grammar is how do you combine these into larger, let's say, um, larger aggregations, communications, which means something. So you can plug in a meeting zone into the working zone. You can nest two working zones. You can overlap two working zones and generate a new working zone. And overlap is very important, overlap and gradients in parametric semiology. You can overlap a two work zones and generate a meeting zone. You can overlap a meeting zone with a work zone and generate a new meeting zone. So, so the grammar works with respect to social situations and the and the the, the, the combinatorics of generating new uh, conditions, so so that works quite well. And then there is an overall distribution and ordering from more closed spaces to more open spaces, and uh, where where even we have an in betweening between the bound and unbound. Always gradients, always in betweening that makes it and always variation, not a traffic sign system but the parametric semiology. So here what we are looking at therefore is and we have kind of color coded as well from light to dark, the kind of transitioning. 
from one condition into the into the other to create an overall field. We also have a kinetic transformation and an adjustment so that that doesn't interfere with the meaning. And if two uh, amoeba spaces lock into and become a convex space, then that is a large meeting zone. So the meaning is switching according to kinetic transformations. And then we go to the next level. So the same semiology uh, applies to furniture as well. So the meeting table would be a convex table. That makes sense. The amoeba um, style uh, table is the working table. Um, we can also have uh, these edges are not necessarily walls. There might be steps. There might be ceiling soffits. So there's a number of, let's say, detailed levels of uh, articulation of the general vocabulary distinctions. So that's the way we just quickly will show you that you can develop it. Um, and then we have another layers of, of lighting, reinforcing this or generating new meanings. Everything you have, which makes a phenomenal difference, should make a semiological difference. So light levels mean something with respect to the degree of intimacy or formality of the situation. Color means something, materiality, carpet with this hard surface. And actually, to some extent, we expect that, except we need to rigorously systematize that. Uh, in environment, we can then kind of read off even if we haven't been there. We learn the language and we can explore a whole Google campus where this language is active. The next level is that instead of this kind of just parametric, uh, let's say, Mayan modeling kind of underlying language, we actually can go into what I call tectonism. It's the latest version of parametricism. And there we can use these technically necessarily new used morphologies as medium of articulation. The, you know, what you can see here is that the level of expressiveness in terms of uh, overall global form, they are not just nerve surfaces, but they're particular the tensile surfaces, the anti-clastic, synclastic, certain compression or pneumatic surfaces. They all have a particular character and, and individuality we can experience and grasp. We have pattern recognition with respect and there's a lot of patterning variety. So that vocabulary, the palette, the tectonism palette for the symbolic project is much enlarged and rich. And I think this also translates beautifully later and less constrained, of course, in the virtual world. So here we can make a network of similitudes and differences. You have contrast and the contrast uh, in, in, in material, but similarity in form. And here you have similarity in material and contrast in form. And again, similarity in material and contrast in form. So, so we can make a network. It is uh, where you have um, multiple dimensions intersecting in each element. Wow. The next level is, um, and this again, I think this was developed, of course, for the physical world, for the urban and architectural world. And some of those thinking in terms of system of differentiation, of contrast, of similarities, of variation, of gradients, of intersecting uh, various meanings to generate a new meaning, all this would apply and will apply and should apply to cyberspace. The next uh, uh, thing we did was also that we wanted to, in our architectural projects, um, show what this meaning is. So this is a color coding. These different spaces mean different things. Some of them are let's unbound versus bound, where you move fast, where you move slow, where you gather. And we show that by putting the meaning into the model, which is we're actually putting the social forces into the model and the behaviors of, let's say, um, language competent users uh, are accordingly uh, ordered by the underlying text. So it's a big kind of text of instructions. That's what we should look at uh, space being. And then we uh, have these even kinetically transforming and we, we have these uh, events unfolding according to the ordering matrix, structuring, and this kind of, let's say, text of instructions written and broadcast in 3D. And of course, on the web, we also navigate, we, 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 we scroll and click and navigate and choose and meet in the web and take whatever comes to us and inform the screen as a as a text of instructions. 
basically as a kind of traffic sign system, semiology. And we've kind of done that, uh, also applied this to our own internal um, um, own offices where we are simulating different arrangements and rearrangements. But if you look at these, you might as well look at a virtual world and avatars roaming around. So the same research project of what I call agent-based climatic semiology, life process modeling, simulation, could also be avatar simulation. And actually, in fact, we can fill the, our worlds with avatars and we can be ourselves, join, or we send our autonomous roaming around and simulating our own preferences and filling those spaces with agents, autonomous agents would stand in for us and accumulate the set information for us. So we have this kind of AI substitutes. Anyway, so that was uh, this project and we quite downstream ahead with working on real projects, major real projects like the big technology campus in Sparebank where we uh, generate these big open spaces, no walls, total intervisibility, inter-awareness, but then a kind of semiological structuring of the different domains, zones, sub-zones, areas. And uh, and, and so we, we, we're setting up our agents and they, they really, can mirror a corporate diagram, a corporate population with the various teams, the various hierarchical levels, uh, you know, throw in a percentage of visitors or consultants, and you can simulate the population. Then you run the agents. We can literally run hundreds and thousands of agents. The way they have their own um, uh, agendas, meeting schedules, informal, uh, uh, meetings, uh, we chart them, the encounters and, and communications which occur, scheduled and unscheduled. We then kind of measure this, compare this, have different design setups, and we're running comparative um, um, simulations to see which of these configurations of entrances, exit, meeting rooms, and as well kind of table patterns, how you kind of, in with how they're different in terms of intervisibility and uh, let's say permeability, generates a kind of comparative matrix of, uh, let's say, social functionality efficiency in terms of what we really want. We want intensified communication, encounters, communications, meetings, uh, sorry, and, and, and information exchange. So, so that's what we can do. And, and we can literally, uh, let's say, we, we want to then, and we are about to looping that into uh, evolutionary optimization loops. So we generate socially functionality optimization in these mega floor plates and important that we have a lot of degrees of freedom there if you have these huge floor plates and literally thousands of people and positions on them the amount of combinatorial potentials you might want to try and test is becoming very, very large and, and and if you just look at it you have no clue which of these layouts would deliver the particular let's say social functionality agendas and maximize um communicative potency in the space so that's what we're doing. And uh, we then kind of run these simulations. We can experience in first person as well. You can imagine what I'm looking at here is simulations of physical environment, but this could also be a digital twin where I'm inviting in already the client and their staff to occupy a head of construction, construction building five years in five years, but maybe in half a year next year, they can already move in and start using the digital twin rather than sitting at home uh and and in using zoom and email so that's the idea and we'll call, talk about later of what i call a cyber urban incubator so and again as i said these simulations at the moment are meant to simulate um real interaction process for later but they can also simulate vr worlds and we can start thinking about the ar overlays which will be um possible i mean because this will not be just computer screens. There will be whole walls of screens, there will be projections, but there will also be Google glasses and aug augmentation. So, I'm, and, and for that, you will have that overlay, that layering of real virtual or the extension of the real into a purely virtual, the standalone virtual ahead of construction or totally standalone as well, of course. We, with, our, with multiple clients, we're now approaching these clients 
and uh, offering the idea of a virtual uh, precursor, a virtual ahead of time uh, in habitation. And I'll just show you a lot of these headquarters we're doing in China, some of them under construction, a lot of them is big atria, bridges, uh, atria for intervisibility, interconnection, networking, 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 <laughs> and um, uh, simulate, running simulation across those. And while they're being built, we already have a full a virtual world. We could, in theory, launch ahead of moving in. And again, all of our buildings have this feature of bridges and atriums, of intervisibility, inter-awareness, of uh, space of flying. I mean, they're wonderful also for cyberspace. I can see a lot of our work is, you know, mean as if, as if meant for cyberspace. Um, and the latest one, Oppo headquarter for telecommunication company Oppo. And again, we're doing these, the different intervisibility, this top of towers, atria, bridges. The themes go through the, the, the open plates filled with interaction uh, and um, cores pulled to the side and, and make space for an uninterrupted floor plate, which we've done, we're doing in Hong Kong for a big new tower. And there's something we also, we learned from Rogers. If you think about Lloyds of London or the cheese crater, great, 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 great structures where the where the cores are getting out of the way and atria and, and the connections take over. And I think this is a wonderful uh, world. And again, a beautiful virtual world potentially. So that's what I'm looking for. And you can see the different uh, uh, top of tower uh, uh, scenarios, which at the moment working through. And again, towers have been such, uh, you know, cellular, spaces all the floors cut away from each other on each floor the core gets in the way of intercommunication so to open up to hollow them up to open them on the base to open them at the top uh, has been a kind of big theme for us and uh, the next chapter i'm going to briefly get into is this idea of dramaturgy the idea of creative spontaneous environments because these environments are not remaining fixed as we are agile and roaming and moving around maybe the built environment can follow suit Maybe not big structures, but the interiors become fluid. So what I'm talking about here is um, a project which was developed with AADRL. There's several projects, one, two, three, actually four different projects where we have a lot of kinetic elements, where we have uh, canopies opening up, courtyards opening up, roofs opening up, a lot of activation of the outdoor space talking privatization of urban spaces to really activate and have them. But more importantly, feminology, semiology, and dramaturgy now foregrounded that we actually have these um, robotic systems. We have architectural agents as well as human agents. And if you go into Unity and you develop the agent AI, that can be equally developed for the simulated human agents as well as for the simulated architectural agents they have their utility functions they are maximizing their utilization they have certain ranges of activities that they respond to certain situations to certain zones in which they're doing certain things so so the, the these kind of let's say the the the, uh, the tools coming out of the gaming ai world fit into architecture and fit the kinetic project fit the creative spontaneous environment project and fit these you can see would be real as well as virtual so we have a lot of these kinetic systems where each element has multiple situations and we always test it with the users nothing is uh, just to look at stare at and let's say uh, get an orgasm about as a piece but the real purpose is that it structures little social diagrams configuration, social situations, and then it's placed between them, that we are flexible and agile because we have so many different situations per day now. We're not just sitting at our desk uh, for 10 hours. We need to engage and, again, communicate, 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 collaborate, the vision of labor, share knowledge, share expertise, share, share skills, and share tasks, and divide tasks. So Run this for a while, Let's enjoy this video.
So there are several of these projects and they also connect up. The idea was to have an urban district where one <laughs> connects up to the other. I mean, you can also, you know, similar to Decentraland where you would have these plots, location, 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 who you're next to, who you're networking with. So even in virtual space, if it's an integrated system like Decentraland or Somnium space, you would actually have similar conditions of a value creation. Of course, you would also have parallel attempts to create this. But I can imagine that in the end, it's one standard, like Facebook, everybody has their, their site, and there will be a virtual city or global city or virtual world, which will dominate and have these network effects. And then, of course, all architects will build together that one global city or planet, let's say. So that's what I foresee. These dynamics will play out and we are ready for it. We want to participate in it. And uh, the first step towards this is what I call the cyber urban incubator. We have a number of companies or sorry, clients with projects which are all about these network uh, spaces of bringing together uh, for the post Network Society clusters of related industries where communication and interaction is very important where these companies come together because they form a hub, because they want to collaborate, they want to learn from each other, work with each other in these incubator uh, spaces. So one of them is uh, Chengdu, Chengdu Unicorn, the kind of island of you know, highly densely uh, um, uh, built up with, with um, office spaces, incubator spaces, co-working spaces, startup culture spaces to find the next unicorn for China. And uh, so we've developed the, the architecture high density, and that's the kind of real built environment, of course. And we now want to, you know, approach that and see can we, and we're just building one first building, a small kind of startup place. Uh, but I believe everything has been developed so well already virtually. Why not launch this as a digital twin virtual world as a cyber urban incubator before we have the real urban incubator? And let, the, let this become a marketing tool, let this become a kind of social um, se selective tool, network building ahead of physical connection. So this is uh, one of those projects. There are several, we actually have the Chongqing Unicorn, so Chengdu Unicorn, Chongqing Unicorn. And China is full of these kind of, let's say, um, startup tech, robotics industry or biomedical industries, uh, uh, incubator sites, sizable, and we won this for competition as well. We, we're just going to develop this further, and we're already developing the plates, the, 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 the co working spaces, and running first simulations. And again, we can then say, hey, these simulations are actually simulations of avatars in virtual spaces as much as simulations of people in real space. And this becomes very similar because the analogy is, of course, very strong that the whole point of cyberspace is that we will bring our understanding of navigating space, of recognizing situations, of overlooking an urban scene, that we bring that into quickly navigating complex cyberspace, as complex virtual space. So, so the behaviors will be similar. The, the, uh, the understanding of semiology, there's a transfer of understanding. All the learning we've done will be transferred and allows us to quickly uh, understand uh, what we're doing in, in virtual. In the same way the magazine became with its pages and sites and text and image, or the way filing systems, in terms of operating systems based on folders and subfolders, were analogically transferred from the world of office filing systems. So, so analogies are very important. There's nothing really, um, 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 all the innovations are somewhat logically based, like all of languages metaphor and analogically based. So here again, we have uh, we have one more such project in, in, in Chongqing. It's another kind of uh, tech incubator space, which we are developing. So we have a lot of these clients and these are tech clusters. And I suspect that the um, uh, tenants and uh, their various staffs are all um, virtual online savvy. They're, the, they're all in their kind of 20s anyway, like all of Shenzhen is in their 20s and 30s. Um, so they will be uh, making an easy transition from their online gaming into online uh, work interactions. So this one is the last one I want to show. 
is Tencent Shia, the big technology center for Tencent, which has uh, a lot of the office spaces, residential spaces, retail spaces. And uh, so, so again, this is very open, very connected bridges, uh, layers, layeredness, uh, in, intervisibility, a lot of outdoor spaces, indoor spaces, but no walls. And you can see already that this could be a perfect um, 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 online version, virtual version, which we could launch uh, ahead of time. So, so we're working on that at the moment and <laughs> developing, um, um, they're actually very keen on, they believe in, in drone uh, light as being the mode of transportation. And we're now working at the, already on the um, smart retail there. That and we will talk about the online shop and real shopping experience designed together. I think these corporates who, are, who live across that in two worlds and all of them will, they will go to one design company to deliver a synthesis, a unified approach to the real and virtual. And that's the pitch of the Cyber Urban Incubator and that's the idea of cyberspace and we're going to be at the forefront of it. And I hope you all get it and uh, the race is on. Thank you, everybody.